good day welcome to you folks from soldiers it is with great pleasure to see you visiting studio one the pioneer leader of jamaican music i'm going to cake you inside that you can see all around and see where it all began clement dodd and his studio one music that is so accepted in the world today which i really thankful for yeah here he is People run, come, let me give you a demonstration about music education to adulation, y'all. Do it, Jack. All right. I want to be in the rest of the I'm Johnny Moore. They call me Dizzy. Is it Johnny? I'm Leonard Dillon, leader, founder of the group Ethiopians. Lincoln Sugar Minot, youth promotion, Black Roots production, you know, singer, songwriter, producer, and all works. Coming out originally from the studio of Studio One. Welcome, don't know, one love and I. Hi, this is Ken Good, and I'm from Kingston, Jamaica. I'm a singer and entertainer. Yes, um, yours truly, Alton Ellis, and um, here for your interview. Jeans was in, the dangaree, you know, everybody, yeah, yeah. But for this climate down here, it seems what the right thing. No matter what the people say, these sounds leads the way. It's the art of the day from your boss teaching. I can stay it. Hop into the dark to the very last drop. I'm Clement Dodd, better known as Sir Cox and Downbeat, master of the Royal Society of Jazz and king of sound systems. Producers, majority of the best music in Jamaica. The backyard DJ adds his own special flavor. He turns down the vocal track and dubs his own patois rhyme schemes. No, no, no. The first time when I went to Studio One, you know, the first time you go to the studio, you're waiting your turn, right? And I would take a pee pee just to see. They would come out. They would run me up there. <laughs> Whenever we started the session, I didn't really sit down much. I was always dancing, so they used to call me the dancing operator. Everything was going like 24 hours, like this trade. Recording, voicing, cooking, singing, you know, son, and about six person plants inside, it was just going like much, all day, you know. Uh, born in Kingston and brought up in Kingston. You know, basically from uh, Orange Street to East Street, you know. And when you were growing up, that was their music in the house? Well, yes, we had a uh, uh, Martha Richards uh, radio. And we used to listen to the foreign station a lot. 
like Voice of America, listening to people like um, Billy Eckstein and um, Cyril Vaughan, Lionel Lambton, Louis Jordan, you know. And, and what did your mum do? She had a, a, like a grocery store and I was quite busy there helping and um, when I get home from work, you know, because at that time I was a mechanic, so we get off work four o'clock, so by 5.30, we'll be playing music and people would expect that and come from other part of the city, stay outside and enjoy the music, buy a lot of beer and stuff like that, yeah. When did you first start playing in the store? In the late 40s, early 50s, yeah. So how old are you then? We'll take a bit of <laughs> calculation to figure that, yeah. the great Sebastian, he had a sound system which I used to go by on weekends and listen. He, he was playing um, rhythm and blues too, he was playing a lot of Wyoming Harris and stuff like that. Well I first met Mr. Dodd through a DJ that he had by the name of Count Machuki who was the first disc jockey in Jamaica at the time. Was he speaking? No, the speaking um, wasn't really in the swing. I came back and, and changed that with a lot of toasting, you know. And did you get but, that idea from America? America, right. And then I got together with Count Machuki and, you know, would just toast to him like I've heard it on the radio station. No, well, um, Coxon wasn't the first sound system, but um, Coxon's sound system was the first sound system to create these jockeys that would use the microphone in between records. All the other DJs before our time, they would only just put on the records or either dance with a girl or drink a beer, but it wasn't anything exciting. Count Machuki and myself, we are the two persons that started this mic business. The way the rap, you, you felt involved because it sounded like they are rapping especially to you, you know. And this is stuff we came back to Jamaica with that our sound took off because my sound was the only sound that doing stuff like that. In the early, well, this little tree here was very smaller, the sake tree here, and there was a big black mango tree right there. Basically, that cooked it. There was a big black mango tree. 
What? God used to write those mangoes every second. Because if a hundred artists is into this yard, and every man that climbs is like you cannot find no more than two. When you find two, you will never find another one. And if someone else climbs, you'll find two. And you can't find another one. And if this man climbs, he'll find two. That's the way. It was like a joke here, man. Everyone feed up with this mango tree. So, so where did you get the idea to go to America? Well, in the early days, it was a popular um, thing of the recruiting men for Florida, you know, to either work in fruit or vegetable or the sugar cane. But um, that was like the idea of early means of making some good money within a short period. So it was everyone Jamaican? Yeah, 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 all Jamaican. So did you mix with the Americans at all, or? Really, at work. Yeah, at work, we mix with it. And uh, weekend, you know, when you go party, you mix a lot with the Americans. So would the parties be in town, or? Yes, more, yeah, you'd say in, the, in town. Have you ever seen it would be jukeboxes. When we go to like um, live shows, then it's quite different with the band. Because you didn't have sound system in America at that time, just the jukeboxes. Well, when you're driving in high, it makes you think you're driving in low. Well, when you hit 85, still think you're going slow. Well, the closer you get, the faster that cat like goes. Get up, little car. I gotta go catch my gal. Well, she's riding in the cat like riding with my best friend. While I was there, I sent um, the amplifier. Uh, along with a lot of records and stuff like that. So you knew that was what you were going to do? Yes, and um, I sent diagram of how like the box to be built. Then my old lady got involved, gave out the boxes, and she just started. She, as a matter of fact, she was the, the very first female DJ in Jamaica. I get ideas from some of the jukebox, you know, to build these box with a lot of glass and fancy stuff and writing on it. When the amplifier, the power of the amplifier was much less, it wasn't strong enough to break the glass. So we went for beauty, you know. So they made it a glass? Yeah, yes, certain spots. drums were over on that side, the bass man right there, and um, the arms would be here, and the vocals would be in, uh, somewhere in, in the middle there doing that thing. You know. Well, yes, this back microphone was Bob Marley, famous microphone. And up to now, you can't go no higher than this in studio microphone. It's a normal. This is the top of the line. Cedric Brooks, Cedric or Roland or Tommy. 
Why was he separate from that? No, he used to play, he used to play what the guitar most of played, spa, spa, well, that's why we call him Scat Gambo. I notice uh, while working generally, I usually find that coming from the back of a speaker, there usually is a, a softer, heavier sound of the bass. So I actually created a bass box where I put an aperture at the back and put a mic at the back. So in other words, not the front of the speaker, at the back. Came back, fresh ideas, big boxes, attended um, the popular sound system of the day, see what they were doing. And um, Drew Creed was a friend of the family. So I had the records. So I used to go around, play them on his sound system, so as to see how the, the dance fan would accept it. On his sound system? On his sound system. Or he let you try it out? Or? This was doing a lot, a lot for him because I was playing record that he didn't even know. It was many sound system in those days. Sound system had just begun because um, orchestra started to fade out around 1952. All the orchestras started to leave Jamaica and start to make their base in England. So, do you think he knew that you were you were? training to start competition? Or? Well, maybe, but he wouldn't really figure me that um, much uh, competition to him because he's a b bigger person and um, in the business well established, you understand? There was another man around who was Duke Reed, the Trojan, and the contest used to be between Duke Reed and Sir Coxon's downbeat at all time. I got a job at um, Bacha Milan, and uh, I think this is where we really hit it strong. I put the two of them together. Same clash? Yes, as a double song for one night. Duke Reed and Coxon. So the booking was um, between me and Juke. Well, Juke was the senior son, so he pulled the crowd. Himself, Count Machuki, was the disc jockey, and, and myself were at that dance, monitoring the sound. The Juke opened the dance, and I would come on about 12 o'clock in the night. And um, surprisingly, we really upset the whole thing because they figured that I was the man of the evening. And this was around 1954, 55. And was that exciting? Very excited because you Creed himself was really a big sound too. Being um, a young sound at that time, they thought maybe I was able to play two hours, but after they see how I held the crowd, then they just send home Juke and let me play for the rest of the night. Coxon grew up with we. Duke Reed was an ex-policeman. So because of that, I think the crowd would follow Coxon more. Although him, you Creed, used to have a good following. But the regular boys, as I would call it, the regular boys, the corner boys and the street fellows, them everybody cling to Coxon because we are all coming through the same tracks. So what we thought of playing, if you came over and started playing songs that people never heard before and they move into it, to keep them in that groove, to play another good song that they're familiar with, to keep that you know groove going, then you might hit them with a, a new song. 
but you have to make certain that it's something good enough that could keep them going. Well, my name is Winston Sparks, a.k.a. King Street. I was born in Kingston, the year 1940. Jackie heard a guy whistling. And Jackie said, that's in sharp, you know. And Roland said, yes. And Roland took up his arm and led that. And finds it was E sharp and said, you, you're going to be a great musician. Well, my name is Lassels Perkins, born Jamaican, Kingstonian. To be told in the front, there was, there was something about Lee Perry that up until this day have me mystified. He's a mystical individual. Every artist in Jamaica those days says if you don't break that barrier, if you don't beat barrier, you, you, it's like you're not reaching nowhere. So you have Joe Creed fan coming there touting for Joe, you have my fan touting for me. Then if there's a town, a third town, you have fans from them come there. So it's actually organised to be a, a clash? Yeah, that's right. You know. So we'd clash and then sometimes those clash work all oh, for each person. But if you're not really playing that suitable for the people, the people don't you know, and then so would that be, would you have a different, do you each have your own sound system? Yes, each of us had all. So would it be one at one end and the other at the other end? And, and yes, and sometimes we are like about here, because although this may be uh, the platform, my sound, the other person's sound, the other person there, and the other person there, but the speaker box is spread all over. So as to cover um, the dance hall properly, you would have three of us in this corner here. We have um, a box each. There it goes. So when you switch from one to the other, you don't hear much difference because the box is there. It's only that if one sounds better than the other, it's quite clear. Kingsland would accommodate at least probably more than 4,000 people. 4,000? Yes, Kingsland was a really a big place. It, it, Kingsland take up a block, one block. It take up from Church Street to Lovely. Height of the, the sound clash was when we started uh, making local recording because that time you could have more songs than your competitor and better songs if your um, recording was good. That excel you to the top. You'll be real king, you'll be not jolly thing. It was talk about you've got you with the cream of the crowd. And you don't be able to say about musical power, or you'll become a world slower. To keep uh, the identity for, from the, the folks, we used to scratch, scratch the label. <laughs> not even the label. Uh, the label also the names. So where did you get that idea? <laughs> I wonder where, but I wasn't the only person doing it, you know. Everybody who had a good record that was, uh, wasn't popular. They erased, erased the name and the label because sometimes you'd be able to track the record because you know what label it's on. Because, um, of erasing the song, 
you had to really give it a name. Yeah. So, um, you had songs like Cox and Hop, Down Beach Shuffle, and, and stuff like that. How long did you have, like, say Cox and Hop? Yeah. How long did you own it before someone else had it? Well, Cox and Hop, I don't think anybody ever gets a road to that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. In America, the rhythm and blues was kind of fading, dying out. Then came the rock and roll. But the rock and roll didn't go over strongly in Jamaica. So about that time, we realized we had to really make some music of our own to keep the people happy. So, um, went in the studio now and start recording. So the first couple of times I went inside, we did a little calypso there, a little tango, you know, dance every night. And um, we did some rhythm and blues, tried to copy the rhythm and blues with that driving beat. And um, after a couple of sessions, you see how the people accept it. They felt that, you know, he was on a good track. He was doing recording at the time for his sound, not for, not for publication. You know, it was like dub plate, because all the other sound systems usually go to America and buy the same songs that he went and bought two weeks ago or three weeks ago. So he couldn't stay ahead of them and playing the same song that they are playing. So he began to record his own thing to play on his sound. We did a um, reference disc, which is now called Dub, Dub Plate. And you'd make your reference disc and you come to your party and find out that the people love it so bad. So if you have 
more than one um, set system because at one time I had five, you understand? So I would have to cut five dub off of that um, specific record. <laughs> When we started, um, we didn't have an idea this could be a business. This record was saleable. We knew it was suitable and we were trying to satisfy our dance fun and things like that. You understand? But we didn't have a clue that this could really work out into something saleable. So, so do you remember the, the musicians you picked, first of all? Well, yes, I started early with Kluge and um, Roland Alfonso, Johnny Moore, um, Judd Jerry, and quite a few. We were playing on so much free party, and the word was getting around, and then everybody is happy to know is Jonathan from off the corner that they know is singing this song, you know? So were but, the people and the, were the musicians, did they come to the party to hear it? Oh, right? yes, 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 man. Roland never miss a party. <laughs> He's always there. And, you know, even the vocalist, if he has something that is current and moving, he, he has to be seen, show himself and, you know. And then the dance hall now. You see the talking about dance hall? Dance hall was long ago. Then I would have to go to the dance hall to hear the dub. When I did that song, You're No Goody, I asked him which dance he's going to take it tonight because he have three set, number one, number two, number three, right? And he told me, well, he's going to take it to Forrest's Hall so I can meet him out there. And I went there and the first night I didn't hear it because when Machuki, the selector, he selects how he feels, so I'll be there the whole night and I don't hear my song. And then I'd go back another night, and I hear, you're no good, and everybody dancing, you know? One of the early records we released was Easy Snapping, and that was like um, about a year and a half, two years after it was um, actually recorded. But it was so strong, and people were saying, don't be twelve. Don't make a record of that. I will say. You think it will sell? I say, yeah, man. So we we'll give it a try, and that was the start of the business. Because then we realized, you no, know, it could be a business because records like that sold a lot. The island is J.A., Jamaica. The North Coast has a steel band or two and enough calypso to make your Arthur Murray money well spent on a honeymoon in Ocho Rios. 
but chances are you'll miss the real pulse of this island, the real sound. Oh, it can be heard just a few steps from Duns River Falls, just a 24-inch speaker away from the Jamaican hill. But it isn't yet a part of the modified American plan. So you'll fly home humming, welcome to Jamaica where the rum come from, without having heard one skank guitar chord, not one bulldozing bass riff, not one wailing lyric of J.A.'s heartbeat, reggae. Welcome to Jamaica, where the reggae come from. Started at Brentford Road, yeah, about six to one, you know, yeah. And was that a big step? Well, yes, of course, because um, we could spend more time putting the records, the sounds together, so you'd get a perfect record. When you hire a studio, you're kind of watching the clock on the wall, and sometimes you accept. I take just because of time is running out. But when you have your own studio, you know, you try to get perfection and you stick to that. At that time, I was the only person in Jamaica who was recording steadily with a in house band. Do they pay the wage Do they, for the week or for a session? Or? No. Um, after we got things going and was certain of ourselves now, then I started a weekly arrangement with the band. The, the band would play from Monday to Friday, say 10 to about 4 in the evenings, 10 to 5, you know, around that time. And that was a weekly thing we had going. So. And did, did people like that arrangement? Or? Yeah, man, they love it. And you see why that went over um, strong is that the only place that was hiring um, musicians steadily per week was the hotel. And what they was making here, they was happier recording here than the hotel. The hotel wouldn't pay that kind of money. Was it also that they could play more interesting music? Yes, because the hotel they stick to uh, stick to the calypso and the little you know ballad here or there, but here they come in and never know what they're gonna end up playing. You know. How how often did you work? Well, we worked. It was like a daily situation, and um, everybody looked forward to it because um, we were enjoying what we were doing. You know, when we just got started, um, the bass player, Cloet, he was more or less the upfront person. When we come in to record, you would say, everybody has the line. That is to say that everybody has to be 
mentally prepared to do the job because everybody's getting paid, so everybody got to have an input. <laughs> it's not that you're getting ten dollars to arrange and I'm gonna get five dollars to pay. Everybody's collecting the team, so everybody has got to have an input in the thing. Yeah. When we was playing the boogie boogie and the, the shuffle and thing like that, we realized that we were definitely swatting or copying the American stuff. But after playing and experimenting along the way, we realized we could do something on our own. And then just for that difference, this is why we decide to really come up and stick to the scale. So you thought we want to make some in Jamaican? Some Jamaican sound, true Jamaican sound. Out of scat came scat lights because um, we were in the studio here and after we experimented and got it over, it was the men inside here that's doing most of the, um, the ska. So we just gave them the name, the scat lights, you know, something to identify that they were definitely in ska. We decided on, on drafting some of the people that played in the studio, those who feel could put a very dynamic group together. And so we did that. We called on a Makoka Alfonso as, as outsiders and um, Jerry. Did you release records by them straight away? Like the first Scatalites Oh, yes, because when Scatalites came about, it had developed into um, a record business. In the early stage, when we was recording people like um, Kluge and stuff like that, we thought this was only for our sound system and the, the dances. So after releasing a couple and realized it was so successful then, realize everything now. But did you think of yourself as a ska band or a jazz band or a Jamaican? Or the name was Scatolite, was a ska band, you know. We played other music, sometimes we play a waltz or two, or sometimes we play one of the American pop things, but our basic aim was to propagate ska. Yeah. They seemed to record a lot, a lot of material very quickly. Well, yes, because they were, they were the cream of the musician, you know, available. Because after you have Roland and you have Tommy, then you have the two best um, handsmen there, tenor. Jackie was very, um, Johnny was very good. Not to mention um, Don Drummond. So I always imagine it was Don Drummond's leading the group, is that not? Well, he was so popular that some people would figure he was the leader, but at all times it was really Tommy. Yeah. But um, when it come to session now, Dan would come to the session with his, his own um, composition. You understand? Even more than the rest of the guys. What we did were like backing vocals. We had vocals who come in and we would um, put the music together for the vocalists. They'd come with a, 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 
a set of lyrics and they probably have a melody sometimes, but as far as the arrangement of the music, the musicians generally put it together. Would the singer be in the room when you recorded? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like though no, when you, um, you lay with him, everybody had to work as uh, the mics were limited and I guess the tracks were limited too. Yeah, well, where you get the melancholy to know is from the Danjo Man's um, writing. He has that sound. You know. And was that, I mean, was that to do with how he felt, or just do you like Well, that? yes, uh, yeah, how he felt and he was like that, you know. And did you like that? that yeah, we love that because um, it's like the uh, wind instrument kind of lay back and then the, the rhythm is pumping and the, <laughs> it's just like the the arm the, uh, just lay, lay back and the rhythm section is pumping, you know. So it just gave you that double feeling, you know. It was good. It's not like it did a lot of tunes. We did some before we were named Scatterlight, and the Scatterlight lasted for about a year. And we, we did a lot of songs in that year, because like I said, actually every day we were here in the studio, and it's, it's like a day's work. Uh, nine to five, we'd come in and we'd work, and we don't have any set time to get out. So we'd work till we, hey, that, that's it. Uh, I'm not enough for the day. You know? Good morning. You're welcome to the Success Club. This is where we had all the good vibes going in 1960, 61, 62. Right here was the good old Success Club. This is where we had um, the good Monday night dances with Count Hazzy, Sir Coxon Downbeat, 
We had a lot of clash here too, dance clash, Jew Creed, Sir Coxon, Lord Coos, yeah. But it was all fun. It was all fun. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> Long gone days. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the Coming up, coming up, I've been introduced as one of a great old fan. See you on Jackson. This was a great um, fan of ours. In the 1960s, all these men <laughs> made it good, you know. All these men are great guys. Yes. Wrong beat. Wrong beat. Bless <laughs> <laughs> it. So where was the DJ and where were the sounds? In, in, in the sound side. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Side. Yeah. side. Yeah, inside. Up on the veranda. Up on the veranda. You would sit up inside on the veranda. Up on the veranda. Where are you playing for, you know? Sometimes we sit up inside, sometimes we sit up outside. Yeah, yeah, let's go to the back. Yeah, 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 Kitchen and bar. Kitchen and bar. Why was Coxon's the best sound system then? No, because the best it, music. It, it, music, it, it, music, 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 Success was the main fun place. Yeah. A lot of fun. You don't say yes when it's success. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man, everywhere that you go, they will tell you that success was a good success. Success was the best. Yeah. I'm from 6 to 9 to 10. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm It's like we're going off here for a little soda. Who that? You can come here. Yeah, yeah. come here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Go to the regular place. Of course I did it. Right through the night, you heard that people coming inside your house, so, you know. It's um, loud, so it travels for a distance. We have people far away to hear the sound. But sometimes you have a dance here, the right in front here is the neutral on, right in front here. Sometimes you have another step over there. Yeah. So, it's who is playing the best music yeah. that track. Yeah. So did you like the competition? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that competition all the way, all the way. I had a lot of respect um, for Duke because um, he's the elder of us, right? And uh, the friendship went back to my parents knew him. The competition was just like when you're in the dance hall. But when you meet together as men, you try to be, you know, cool and all right. It was very diplomatic between the both of them because Duke, Cox and always treat him with disrespect. Duke is a whole man than, than Cox, you know? And Cox, you always treat him with disrespect. Hello, Mr. Reed, and treat him like that. But when him turned back, him was like, damage him musically, serious. <laughs> yes, son. So it was just this thing going on between them. And Mr. Reed is a man that, you know, just people and, and their ways because he always have this gun at his side and have this grumpy face. Juki got a liquor store and the studio. The liquor store is downstairs and the studio is upstairs. But he's got a, a, a speaker box wired to the, the liquor store, right? So whatever is going on upstairs, he can hear it. And remember, if what he hear he don't like, he's coming upstairs with all them guns, you know? <laughs> The, the, the leak in regards to Treasure Island Studio One now. Studio One have that song, that, that street song. From you hear it, all the mistakes you like and everything about it, you're going to like that. It does have that sound, that catching sound. You know, with Jackie Me Too behind it, you know, that Jackie Me Too feel. And that was what I mean by the leak. Duke Tune was stiff and straight. You understand? And to the point. No, no, no leaning that way and it was just. Like that, that's, that's the difference with the recording, you know? I came remember on one occasion, I was sitting in the studio and he normally have Tommy McCook and, and this um, saxophone player called Marquis, Irma Marquis, right? So whenever there is any mixing, when they are mixing the, 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 the tune, them, right, Tommy or, or uh, Marquis would be there and one day we were there and they were mixing a song and Joe Creed was sitting down and observing what was going down. So he heard something that we didn't hear, you know, and he asked, um, he asked Errol to stop the tape and said, he looked at us and said, didn't you hear that? So I said, no. He looked at Marcus and said, didn't you hear that? Marcus said, no. He said, run the tape again, <laughs> right? And when, when I played by the tape, we still couldn't pinpoint what he was on about. So, where I was sitting, I was sitting, um, the, the mixing board was, it's like the mixing, Juki was in front of me, sitting down, right? And I was sitting beside the mixing board, beside Errol and Marcus over that way. And, but I wasn't paying much attention to Joke. I was listening, see if I could hear what he was talking about, right? 
And all of a sudden, I hear a shot rang out, you know. Joke take out him gun and fire a shot in the corner right beside me. <laughs> right? And he said, he said, that damn rat. <laughs> right? There was no rat there, right? You know? There was no rat there. He just wanted to get, get us listening, you know what I mean? Saying that we, we, we are we are ugly, you know. You know, the, the, that shot was so loud, man. I just jump and you know, <laughs> but that's joke, you Actually, at Studio One, we were the first to be recording strictly local music. And um, I th think because of that, I had the edge over the other producers who had to rent a studio or whatever it is. And then um, the 60 was a very good period for me because I went into strictly um, building of artists, you know. I'm in a dancing Exciting and feel so good to know that because really, Whalers was the upcoming group at that time. As a young group, it was more revolutionary in those days. And there was a group of young people going with. And to know that I was among Whalers and they are the one that bought my first recording it was very exciting, you know. Lovely. Shoot the one is the is where I really enjoy my youth. 
it was like a family feeling, you know. So even the whole artist was doing this also to help me. To help the kiss. Well, I, I guess um, the, my other competitors, or the people in the business, um, didn't have much faith in the business because um, I think I was the first black man to really start with this as a business. You know, both having the studio, having the, um, the shop, the record store, and even started to export the records. In order to accelerate economic development and to raise living standards, Jamaica is putting increasing emphasis on producing and manufacturing for export. What was originally produced to meet the demands of the domestic market must also now be suitable for export. These products must meet the high standards of quality set in the international marketplace and have a distinct Jamaican characteristic in craftsmanship, content, and design. At that time, we were, I was weak to music. Wherever it goes, it lowered me, you know. Wherever we would know that uh, a bunch of uh, musicians get together playing, we find ourselves there and listening. <laughs> They used to play in the hills, Warwicker Hills. They used to rehearse there. And um, I used to attend rehearsal and things like that. And then the idea came up that I would really keep a dance in the city here with my sound system plus their drums. And we had that at the Success Club on Monday night. And it was 
great success, you know. When I left the military band, I also left home because I'm um, getting involved with Rastafari at that time. You automatically became an outcast. So um, you had was to find some Rasta bridging where you could go and, you know, spend your time, you know, and I, I chose counters because um, I was in love with the way that they play the drums there and I, I, I like playing with the drums, so I chose that area to really spend most of my time. Through they were playing drum, a lot of the wind instrument used to go by them as a means of rehearsing. Such as? Yes, um, Johnny Moore, Dan Drummond, Tommy, Seam Roland. Well, and the cameras, he didn't mind that, he thought that was... No, he loved that because that was um, big and in, in his area, he was the big guy because you have, you know, a sort of top musician coming by his place. <laughs> You are now entering P.O.R.A. famous Monday night dance hall. Welcome. Come on in. Good day, good day, good day, good day. So this was where we had the sound system set here yeah, on stage. And then this would be the dance hall. You had speakers like right in front here. You had speaker at each end of the dance, and then the rest of the speaker would be outside on the lawn. So, so what would people be wearing? In that suits or shirts? No, no um, casual. At time, um, 
jeans was in, the dungaree, you know, everybody, yeah, yeah. yeah. But for this climate down here, the suit wasn't the right thing, you know, just a t-shirt or What did the, what did the women shirt. wear? They were nice, crazy clothes, but yeah. And did you, did you have to come with your wife, or did she not come? Well, um, once in a while, but you know, it's best to leave the wife to take care of the home, while you take care of the business. Uh, yeah, this is Rosemary Lane, you know? Yeah, outside here, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the bar used to be in just that little section there. And we said the bar where you serve the, the drinks and the curry goat and whatever. So, so um, how would people know to come here? Yeah, you have know, flyers out, you promote it. And they even like the night of the dance, we used to have a car with on playing the music and announcing the dance and showing out flyers, you know. And did you have like banners or anything up? Yes, yes, for, because um, two weeks before the, the, um, the day of the date of the dance, you'd have a banner out there and you'd have your regular in invitation that you give out at least two months prior to the dance. Two months? Yeah, that's right. And you're f this is where you're from, isn't it? This is where you grew up? Yeah, yeah, all so, this area, yeah. So did you know most of the people? Yeah, you? we know most of the people, but you see, actually, what really draw the crowd is the dance promoter. You can yeah. walk from here and go right up there. No, you, you can go that. every dance song. Five dance given tonight. And we're going to go all them. I'm going to walk the dance we go. from one to one yeah. and a bunch of us. So you think that's and nothing change? wrong, I'm but things change. Yes, like life changed. Right. These new yeah. people grew up hostile and vile. We don't ought to go with them. So we keep our cool while they end up like a fool. Yeah. yeah. They come, <laughs> they come <laughs> to the bar. <laughs> yeah. They come to the bar <laughs> and they order the drink. We take a, <laughs> they don't we want just take a yeah. quick one over yeah. there. Yeah. We're going to set up people. Our friend plays. It's the PMP plays in school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Uh-huh, bye, bye. Old time, last street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went into East Bank too. too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is Rosemary Lane. Right down to Rosemary Lane. That's right. Rosemary Lane. Right. 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 Right.